Good afternoon and welcome to the PASS Database Administration Virtual Chapter Meeting. Uh, my name is Julie Bloomquist and today we're going to have a lecture from Bob Pusatari on locks, blocks, and snapshots maximizing database concurrency. Our sponsor for our virtual chapter is Quest, and we really appreciate their sponsorship, and it allows us to give off some uh, raffles, some uh, gift certificates. We do have uh, discounts for the past 2018 summit. Um, you can use the one discount code, and you can get all of the 2017 uh, summit streaming access. So that's all the uh, lectures that were from 2017. Or could, you could use the code, the second code, and get a $150 discount. PASS is looking for new sponsors to connect with uh, the virtual chapters and just the PASS community. If you uh, have any information, you could pass that along. And uh, you could possibly receive a $100 gift card uh, if a referral leads to a community sponsorship. PASS does have quite a large number of virtual chapters. You just take your PASS login and associate it with the different chapter group. With that uh, chapter, uh, you'll just receive the emails about the meetings. And if you attend the virtual chapter meetings, uh, you're able to ask the questions. If not, all these chapter virtual chapter meetings are recorded and posted on the uh, archive page of their websites. SQL Saturdays are one-day mini conferences. They have multiple tracks. Sometimes they have pre-con classes as well. Here are the ones upcoming uh, throughout the world. You just go to SQLSaturday.com to register for an event if it's near you. You can join both the local chapter or the virtual chapters. You can even start up a chapter if you don't have one in your area. And there's a lot of volunteering opportunities with PASS. Um, and you can also uh, submit uh, nominations for the Outstanding Volunteer Award. So if you want to get more involved with the community, uh, look at uh, volunteering. Oops. So Bob uh, is a Microsoft Certified Master, DBA, and a Systems Architect with over 10 years experience on SQL Server. His interests involved internals, performance optimization, and cloud technology. He's an active member in both the Chicago area chapters of PASS and a community speaker. And he maintains a web presence through both Twitter, at SQLBob, and his blog, bobpusatare.com. And Bob, I'm going to change the presenter over to you. All right, very good. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Appreciate you coming out this afternoon or evening or night or whatever time it might be. Uh, hopefully you all can see my screen now. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, by way of a very brief introduction, uh, as Julie said, I'm Bob Pusateri. Um, I am a solutions architect for Heraflux Technologies. We're a, a consulting group. Uh, we focus on the convergence of data and infrastructure. Uh, we specialize in VMware and SQL Server and several other technologies. Uh, probably the most important thing you'll see on this slide is my email address, which I will have repeated at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I believe you can also type them into the uh, Go to meeting client. Uh, we will do our best to address questions at the end. Uh, if we're running short on time, we may take them offline and I'll publish answers in either a blog post or an email, depending on how we receive them. So, today's session, we're talking about concurrency and isolation levels in SQL Server. Uh, we're going to start with a, a brief introduction to the basics of concurrency. Uh, we're going to then go into isolation levels themselves. That's going to be the majority of this session. And we'll follow up at the end with a, a very, very brief introduction to SQL Server's in-memory OLTP features that were introduced in SQL Server 2014. Um, very brief, but worth explaining how it differs from everything else we just discussed in this session. So to start off, what is concurrency? 
Um, something that's concurrent has the ability for an operation to be broken up into multiple parts, uh, and then these parts can be worked on independently. Uh, they're going on concurrently. Um, it's also the ability for multiple operations to access or modify some sort of shared resource, object, whatever it may be, at the same time. Uh, if you have more parts or more users that are able to do this for an operation, then that operation has a higher degree of concurrency. And this is a great thing usually until some type of limiting factor appears. And that limiting factor can be one of many things, uh, which we'll talk about, but typically it's a resource-bound problem. Uh, if anyone here attending today has a formal education in computer science, you've probably heard at some point of the dining philosopher's problem. Uh, this was a problem that was proposed by Ezra Dijkstra, who was a very famous Dutch computer scientist. He was winner of the Turing Award, which is more or less the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in, in the field of computing. Uh, and he proposed this problem in one of his classes, and I believe the year was 1956. And it goes like this. Uh, we have a table with five philosophers sitting at it. Uh, there's five bowls of spaghetti and five forks between them all. To eat, you need two forks. You can't eat spaghetti with just one fork, you need two. Um, each philosopher can only pick up one fork at a time, and if they're able to acquire a second fork and eat, once they are done, both the forks must be returned to the table. And anytime a philosopher is not eating, they are thinking. So the problem here is, how do we get all the philosophers to be able to eat? We have a resource limitation. Each philosopher needs two forks to eat, but there's only five forks, one for each. So several things can go on or go wrong with this problem, rather, depending on how it's, how it's implemented, how your solution is implemented. What if everybody picks up one fork? Well, then nobody can pick up a second fork because there's only five of them. So we've effectively created you know, a deadlock, right? We're going to have to come up with a solution for releasing of these resources, of the forks, so that some people can eat now and maybe some can eat later. What if there's a time limit? What if once you've acquired one fork, you have so long to acquire the second one, or you have to put the one that you have down already? Adds another little twist. What if someone never gets to eat? Uh, well, technically they starve, and, and resource starvation is a problem in, in computing concurrency as well, so it kind of is a really good illustration when you think about it. And the problem we just looked at here applies to databases. We just kind of need to change the, the Synetrics just a little bit here. So instead of the dining philosopher's problem, we have the database problem, right? We have a table. We have users. Um, instead of spaghetti, we have data tables, data we're trying to access. And instead of forks, we have locks. So these are, these are the same type of problems. And, and the effects of concurrency on this are very real. Um, concurrency conflicts are going to be the major issue we see. Um, and there's several different types of concurrency conflicts. Uh, some of them are actually ANSI defined. The big ones are, they're called preventable read phenomena, uh, dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. And we'll explain exactly what that means in just a moment. Uh, it's important, important to point out that ANSI specifies which behaviors to allow at each concurrency level, uh, but not exactly how to implement the solution. So this can actually vary depending on your database vendor. There's also the issue of lost updates and, of course, deadlocks, which we may be familiar with, uh, but we'll go through them all very, very briefly here. Dirty reads. Uh, this is reading data that has not yet been committed. Changes are then still in flight in another process, but we're reading them as if they are true. Uh, problem with dirty reads is you can end up reading data multiple times or even not at all, depending on how things work out. Uh, and the common argument for allowing dirty reads is, you know, it's faster. And while that can be true, it also, if, if you want a, an incorrect answer very quickly, well, then I guess this is, might be what you want. But if you're looking for some sort of accuracy, I would not recommend it. Non-repeatable reads are also known as inconsistent analysis. And this is where you have multiple queries within the same transaction that get differing results. So you start a transaction. You, you run a query, you run a select statement, maybe do something else, run another select statement and get a different result from the first one. This is because a different transaction maybe changed some of that data between reads and you had no lock on that data to prevent it. Phantom reads are building on top of non-repeatable reads. These only affect queries with a predicate, with a where clause, uh, but essentially 
your querying with a where clause and membership in your result set changes. So your, your result set changes. And when you run multiple queries using that same predicate in the same transaction, you now see different results. It's called a phantom read. We also have lost updates or an update conflict. Uh, this is where one user's update will overwrite another user's more or less simultaneous update. And the end result there is though it may appear as though the first update never happened. Uh, fortunately, this isn't something we need to worry about in the SQL Server world. Uh, SQL Server never permits lost updates in any isolation level. But for academic purposes, we'll discuss it here. Finally, we have deadlocks, which I believe most people would be familiar with. We have two or more tasks that are blocking each other, uh, where each task has require, acquired some resource and is trying to acquire a different one and cannot. So in our very simple deadlock graph here, we have two processes and two resources. Process A has a lock on resource one. Process B has a lock on resource two. Process A is trying to acquire a lock on resource two and can't because of process B and vice versa. This is a deadlock. All right, SQL Server fortunately can detect and resolve these. It will essentially choose a victim. Typically the victim is whichever process has uh, accomplished less uh, or the least amount. Then uh, that victim is rolled back, its locks are released. Uh, hopefully the other processes waiting on locks can then acquire those locks, continue and complete. Now there's, there's multiple ways to address these issues. Uh, the biggest ideas here are we have pessimistic concurrency. Uh, this is kind of the classic concurrency model in SQL Server. This is where you're being pessimistic, you're expecting there to be conflicts, and so you're taking locks on your data to try to prevent these conflicts. Uh, this is the, the classic readers block writers and writers block readers model. And before SQL Server 2005, pessimistic concurrency was all that was available. So it was your only option. Starting in SQL Server 2005, Microsoft brought about optimistic concurrency, and we're being more optimistic here. So we're considering conflicts to be possible, we're just hoping they don't occur because they're unlikely. Uh, this will use row versioning, uh, which means less locking. Uh, there still can be locking, but hopefully not as much. Hopefully the version engine takes care of that for us, and we'll discuss that shortly. So that is our, our brief introduction to the basics of concurrency. Uh, now we'll move forward to SQL Server's isolation levels and how we, we implement these solutions to these problems. The, the basics of an isolation level is answering the question, how isolated is my transaction from the effects of any other transaction? Now, with pessimistic concurrency, there are four different isolation levels we have available to us. There's, there's read committed, uh, read uncommitted, and we'll discuss these all in, in detail in just a moment, repeatable read, and serializable. On the optimistic side, we have two choices. We have snapshot and read committed snapshot. Now, if you're not sure what isolation level uh, you're currently running in, it can vary by your session. Uh, but generally, you'll be in the default, which is read committed, unless you've, you've chosen something different. To find this out, you can run dbcc user options, uh, which is, you know, dbcc command. It will return a whole bunch of settings that applied to your current connection. So each session could, in theory, have different user options. Uh, you'll see there in the bottom row that was returned, you'll see isolation level. In this case, this session was in the default of read committed, and it shows there. To change an isolation level, you can change at either the connection or the query level. You cannot set an isolation level for the entire server. Um, the default, as I said, is read committed. Um, to change it at the connection level, the syntax is this. It is set transaction isolation level and then put your isolation level in. So read uncommitted, read committed, repeatable read, etc. That will change your isolation level for all queries for that current connection. But if you wanna change it at the query level, this is where we use table hints. So the most classic example of this would be with no lock, right? We're selecting a column from a table with no lock. Um, this is on a per table basis. So if you have a query that joins multiple tables together, you'd actually need to specify your isolation level for each table. I think a lot of people don't realize that. But this is how you change isolation levels for either your query or for your uh, connection. 
Now, the idea of, of pessimistic concurrency, as I said, is we're using locking because we're, we're expecting there to be conflict. We're being a pessimist. Uh, we're using locking to try to prevent these conflicts. Uh, readers do not block readers. This is, this is true in pessimistic concurrency. Ideally, if, if two processes are reading, there should never be any conflict. So readers will never block readers. Uh, but readers do block writers and writers do block readers, and, and writers do block each other. In fact, writers blocking writers will always occur, unless we're using in-memory OLTP and things get a little more interesting there. Uh, but again, we're being pessimistic and we're expecting problems. Um, now, we, we talked about locks. SQL Server has many different types of locks at its disposal. Um, there's, there's lock modes, and there's a whole chart of them available in Microsoft documentation. Uh, we're going to focus on just two because we're trying to simplify things here. So the most common ones you'll see are shared, or an S lock, and X, or an exclusive lock. Now, locking in SQL Server works as a hierarchy of objects. So we have a database, the database contains many tables, the tables contain pages, and the pages contain the rows. Locks occur at each of these. So if we're running a query on a database and we're doing a read query, so it's a select operation, the locks will be taken as follows. We have a shared lock, which is taken on the database, which essentially says, I have a connection to this database. Don't do anything to the database while I'm in there. We have an intent shared lock at the table and page level. And then we have a shared lock at the row. Now the shared lock at the row is held for the duration of the read or whatever the isolation level might specify. Um, and the intent shared locks in the middles, those essentially say that there is a shared lock at the lower, at a lower level. So if there's a shared lock on a row, the page will have an intent shared lock on it to say that there is a shared lock inside this row. Same thing occurs at the table. There will be an intent shared lock at the table to show that there is a shared lock on the page. Now for write operations, it gets a little more interesting because we have different types of locks now. We still have our shared lock on the database because we're still doing an operation within the database. Um, the table in the page could be either an intent exclusive lock or an intent update lock. And then the row, could have an exclusive lock or an update lock. Um, in older versions of SQL Server prior to, I believe, 2005, uh, update locks did not exist. Update locks were brought about to, to kind of help play nicer in the concurrency sandbox, if you will. So while waiting to have an exclusive lock, a process would take an update lock and then elevate that update lock to an exclusive lock. Uh, but we need an exclusive lock on the row to modify the row. And then the page and the table will have intent locks showing that we either have an exclusive lock or an update lock at a lower level of that. So this is kind of the lock hierarchy. Um, starting in on the actual isolation levels, read committed isolation level. Um, this is the, the no lock, right? People talk about no lock. No lock is a synonym for read uncommitted. Um, as you can see in the, the top right corner there, read uncommitted allows dirty reads and non-repeatable reads and phantom reads. They're all allowed. Those three classic concurrency problems we had or conflicts, they're all allowed in no lock or in read uncommitted. Um, you may read a row multiple times when you're reading a table with no lock. Um, similarly, you may also read rows zero times. And you can also return results that were never in fact true at any one point in time. Um, read uncommitted only applies to select queries. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people doing update type queries, insert, update, delete, with no lock. Um, that just flat out gets ignored. Uh, if you're doing a data modification query and you specify no lock, SQL Server will just ignore it. Uh, there actually, years and years ago, there used to be a bug that actually could cause index corruption if you issued a data update query with no lock, but that was since been fixed. If I wanted to illustrate read uncommitted in the form of a photo, which I try to do throughout this presentation, I think a time-lapse photo would be very useful. So here I have a time-lapse photo of someone shooting pool. Um, and this was taken over a period of maybe a second or two, but this photo, what we see here, this never occurred at any one point in time. There was never a point in time where the pool balls were all racked up and then flying around the table. That didn't happen. That happened over a period of time. That's kind of what we're seeing with read uncommitted. Read uncommitted can return results which never were true at any one point in time, but we'll have, we'll have the output. We'll have the photo there 
showing us that, yeah, this is what happened according to me. Uh, a couple of myths about read uncommitted. Probably the biggest one is no locks are taken. I mean, that, that's why it's called no lock, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case at all. What that really means is that no shared locks are taken on data when reading. Uh, other locks are still taken as normal, and we'll see that in a demo in just a moment here. And the second myth is that it makes this query faster, right? Use no lock because it's faster. I've seen seen multiple companies and workplace environments that I've I've dealt with where you know, oh yes, let's use no lock because it's faster. No, it's really not. It may be faster in some cases, and really the only case where you'll see it's faster is if you have a lot of blocking on select statements. And if that's the case, you can probably solve your problem with a better solution than no lock. So with that in mind, let's go to our first demonstration here, and we can show what's going on with no lock. So I have SQL Server Management Studio, uh, and I have a demonstration database we're going to use with, throughout this presentation. Um, essentially, and I will restore it here so we have a clean copy, it is a list of every zip code, every postal code in the United States, if you're not familiar with zip codes. Um, so you can have multiple zip codes per city. There's also zip codes for, for non-cities, such as military bases and the like. They're all in this list. Uh, so if we were to just select very quickly from the table here, we have an identity column, zip code ID. Uh, we have zip codes and then the, the city and state where they are from. So the lowest zip code in the US happens to be Holtzville, New York, 00501. Actually, that city has two. It also has 00544, and it goes from there. But we have a list here. We have 41,000 zip codes in the United States, a little over that. So as a, as a quick exercise, how many cities in the United States are named Paris? Well, let's, let's query for that very quickly. Looks like there's 15 zip codes. Uh, there's a Paris, Maine, Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, Paris, Texas has three. It's apparently bigger. Paris, Idaho. So you can just you can query and see zip codes from from any location in the United States in this table. So to demonstrate dirty reads, we're going to start. We're going to begin a transaction and we're going to update our table and we're going to set all the city names in the table to Bob. Right, this is this is clearly a mistake. There should have been a where clause on this query, but there's not. But we did it within a transaction. So now we have 41,000 rows affected within a transaction, which is still open. And now in another session, we're going to select star from zip codes with no lock. So we're just going to select the entire table with no lock. And you'll notice the result set comes back and shows that every city is now named Bob, right? The problem here is that this hasn't officially happened yet, right? This, this transaction running in the other session never committed. Um, and in fact, it won't commit because I'm going to roll it back. But with no lock enabled SQL Server to return a result set that is not true and in fact will never ever be true. But that's what happens when we use no lock. So we're gonna roll back our transaction here. And the second thing I'm going to demonstrate here is just what exactly kind of locks are taken and when no lock is used. So I have a, a brief extended event session script here that's going to uh, capture all the lock acquired events. So anytime a lock is taken for this session, it will record it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we will create our extended event session here, have that running. Uh, and now we're going to run select star from zip codes with no lock. So we're going to scan the entire table with no lock. All right, we just did that, happened very quickly. I'm going to alter the event session and drop that event to flush it from memory so that I can query it. And now I have a query here that's going to look at all the locks that were taken that were captured by the extended event session. And we'll see we have exactly four rows. Now, we have locks, locks were taken. Uh, so that, that kind of kills the myth right there. I use no lock, the locks were still taken. Uh, and the locks we have taken here, we have a shared lock on the database. Um, we have a schema stability lock on the table that essentially will prevent schema changes to the table from happening while we're reading it. So someone can't go ahead and, and add a column or something like that uh, while we're reading it. And we have more uh, shared locks on the database, but there's no shared locks on the data. So that's really what no lock did for us. It, we did not take any shared locks on the data while we were reading it, uh, but we did in fact take locks in, in metadata and on the database itself. I'm going to stop our extended event session here, and we will move back to our presentation. 
All right. So that was read uncommitted. Um, it's not a terrible setting. It gets vilified an awful lot, and, and it exists for a reason. It's just you need to make sure you understand the risks and the consequences of using read uncommitted, and that's where I think a lot of people don't. All right, moving on to read committed. Uh, read committed is the default default isolation level. Um, you do not need to specify with read committed to achieve a read committed read in SQL Server. It's the default. So, and by default, it's the default setting. Uh, read committed snapshot isolation can also be the default setting. You can change the database to read committed snapshot, but that's the those are the only two that can actually be a default. Um, read committed gives us the guarantee that the data we're reading will be committed. So the whole example I just did with no lock goes out the window with read committed. It's not possible. Dirty reads are not possible. And if you look in the top right hand corner, you'll see there's no more dirty reads. There still are non-repeatable and phantom reads. Though. Those are possible. So you get no other guarantees. But you do get the guarantee that your data you read will be committed. And so this is what Microsoft gives you by default in SQL Server. Uh, we're using locking to make sure that only committed data is read. And the catch with read committed is that locks are only last as long as the read operation is occurring. They are released immediately after on a row by row basis. So if we have all our data here uh, and each, each square represents a row, rows that we have already read are unlocked. The row currently being read, the one in red here, uh, that one is locked and the rows that we have not yet read are unlocked. So we literally will lock a row, read the row, unlock it, move to the next row, lock it, read it, unlock it, continue. That is exactly how a scan works in the read committed isolation level. Now, if anyone here is familiar with photography, you may have ever heard or seen perhaps what's called a swing lens camera. Um, a swing lens camera literally has a lens that swings from side to side. Uh, here's a picture of one from Wikipedia. Here's a little diagram kind of explaining how they work. This essentially swings the lens from side to side and allows you to take a very wide panoramic photo. Um, we still do this today. We don't use swing lens cameras though, right? We use our smartphones, but panoramic mode in a smartphone, think about it, you're swinging the phone. Phone has a lens on it, you're swinging the lens. So why am I talking about swing lens cameras? Well, because I have a photo here. Um, my high school took a very wide panoramic photo of the senior class the morning of graduation each year. And they had all these photos from previous classes hanging in the hallway. Um, there was a class a couple years older than mine that was had a particularly notorious photo, and I'll, I'll show it on screen here. This is my high school's class of 1997. Um, and what was interesting about this photo was it had a mythical guy who appeared in the photo twice. So if you looked very closely, this guy over here, while the lens of the swing lens camera was swinging, he managed to get to the other side and show up in the photo twice. Right. This is a read committed photo. If he would have moved in the other direction, if he would have moved from the right of the photo to the left, he would have actually not been in the picture at all. But he went in the right direction and ended up in the photo twice. For fun, I'll also point out that there's someone in the photo wearing a beer is food T-shirt and these are high school seniors. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised the school allowed that. But it was the last day of school. I'm guessing not many people cared by that point. But this kind of illustrates the point that in read uncommitted isolation mode, unlocked rows can move at any time. If your row is not currently being read, it's unlocked and anything can happen to it. So if a row switches, if a row that hasn't been read moves back into the the un, the, the already been read area, well then, then that row won't be shown at all. If it happens in the other direction, it'll happen twice. You'll see them twice. So let's move to another demo here and we'll kind of play a little set of games with read uncommitted isolation levels. All right, read committed. We're gonna re-restore our database so we have a, a nice fresh copy. We're gonna add an index. This database, this table has no indexes on it other than a clustered index on an identity. Uh, so we're gonna add a unique index on the zip code values because they are unique. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the physical properties of this index. So if you've ever used the sys dmdb index physical stats dmv, this VM dmv will display physical statistics of the index. Um, and what we want to see here is this index has two levels. You'll see there's two rows, one for each index level. 
there's one page at the top um, and there's 77 pages at the second level with 41,437 rows, one for each zip code in this index. What kind of locks are taken? We'll get back to this 41,437 in just a second. To see what kind of locks are taken, we're gonna begin a transaction. We're going to select the zip code from the table. We're gonna select all the zip codes and then we're gonna see what kind of locks are currently being held. So let's begin our transaction and run our query. We have our 41,437 rows as we expected, uh, but if we select from sysdm tran locks and we try to look at the locks held by the current session, you'll see there's only one. It's that shared database lock I talked about earlier. Um, that, that's always there no matter where. what. So we have no locks being held which kind of makes sense because as I just described, these, these locks are released as soon as a row is read. So maybe this wasn't the greatest example, but we have other methods. Let's roll back here. Let's use our extended event session. So we're going to create an extended event, and this time it's gonna be a little more uh, complicated. We're gonna look at locks that were acquired and locks that were released. So we're gonna capture both of these events, both the acquire and the release events. And we're gonna start our session. So now if we select all our zip codes, we selected them all, we're going to drop these events so that we can read the data. If we go ahead and we look at the, the locks being acquired and released, we'll see here, and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit, we have some metadata operations that occur at the beginning, but then essentially it's just nothing more than a pattern of lock acquired, lock released, lock acquired, lock released, as I explained. So we have, we have a lock acquired and being released on page 553, then the same thing on 554, same thing on and on and down. So we're actually showing here extended events captured the way these locks are being taken, data is read, they're being released, moved to the next one. That's exactly literally what's happening with locking here. We're gonna drop our extended event session, and we have one more interesting demo. So we're gonna play a little game now. Now, I, sh I showed you we have 41,437 zip codes. Which of them is first? Well, it's the one with the lowest number, which was that town in New York, 00501. What if we were to try to move it? Let's figure out exactly where this row is. So if you've ever used the function sys fn phys loc formatter it's a physical location formatter it will essentially take a row and show you the physical location the actual file the row is in the page and the file and the slot on that page so we're going to run this uh, function for this zip code and we're going to see that this record is in file one page 552 slot zero that is the the physical location pardon me of this record what if we change the value? So we're going to take it from 00501 and we're actually going to update it to be 99999. We're going to send it from the, the beginning of the, the order to the, the very, very end. Did it move? Absolutely. It's now on page 668, slot 473. So by changing the value, we change the physical location of this record, which is you know kind of the basics of how indexing work. So we'll change it back to where it belongs. And did it move back? It absolutely did. It's on page 552 again. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a query in a different session that does exactly what I showed you. All it's going to do is move these records back and forth. So it's going to change it from 00501 to 99999, and then it's gonna move it back. So it's gonna move it from the front of the table to the back of the table, and then back again. And I'm saying go 50,000 here, which means run this 50,000 times. It's just going to sit and repeat. While that's running, I'm going to have another process count how many zip codes there are. So I'm gonna start that process over here. I'm gonna run the second one, which, which literally loops through 10,000 times and inserts into a table how many zip codes are counted. So I'm gonna start this process. And then over here, I'm gonna start the counter process. And this is gonna take just a few seconds to run here. So please be patient for a moment while I get a drink. And I believe the counter process will finish before the process that's moving the data around, which is fine. It does take a little bit to perform 10,000 counts of 40,000 records.
And now we're getting into the territory where it's taking longer than normal. Okay, there we go. Usually takes about 30 seconds. Now it's 42. We're going to stop this other process because we don't need these records flying around anymore. Uh, what we have is we have a table with 10,000 rows, and each row will contain the number of records that it counted on that iteration. Um, so as you can see here, we have we have some differences. We have we have the correct number 41, 437. We have one less than that. Um, if we actually query them all and aggregate, we'll see that we got. We got one record less, 2,079 times one record more, about the same, 2,113, and 5,808 actually contained the correct answer. So what this is showing is in read committed in the default isolation level in SQL Server, um, if you have a lot of data moving around, it's quite possible that you're getting an incorrect value depending on what you're doing. And this is the default setting, so this is something you should probably keep in the back of your mind. Uh, but that is that is this demo showing that that yes, data movement can in fact affect uh, the accuracy of your query results if if just the right thing is happening at the right time or perhaps the wrong time. So moving on. The next isolation level after read committed, if we want to take things up one notch further, we have what's called repeatable read. Um, and repeatable read builds on read committed a little bit more. As you can see in the in the top right, non-repeatable reads are now no longer allowed, which is why it's called repeatable read. Uh, what this means is that if a query is repeated within the same transaction, records read the first time will not change. So if we read a record once, it will essentially become locked and will not change, and it's guaranteed not to change. Uh, locks are held for the length of the transaction now. So we no longer have the issue of a lock being taken and released and then another one being taken. If a lock is taken, it is now held for the entire transaction. And this includes rows that don't qualify as a result. So if we read a row and we determine that it's not in the result set, it still has a lock that's held on it. These locks, however, will not stop additional rows from being added or included in subsequent queries. So if we read a record in and we lock it, it doesn't stop somebody else from being, being inserted later. Um, that would be a phantom read. So to try to sum this up in a photo, this is a little harder. Um, but what I came up with, what's called a front curtain sink flash. So essentially we have a car that's moving, my son's toy car here. Uh, we had the flash that fired, which is the... The, the strong image of the car you see on the left, uh, but then the shutter remained open. Things could still change a little bit, which is why you kind of see the shadow of the car uh, dragging across the carpet there. Not the greatest photo. Uh, to put it in something illustrated a little better, once red, now the row is locked for the duration of the transaction. So the rows that are colored red here indicate that they are being read or were read in the past, those locks are held. Rows that have not yet been read, however, are unlocked. And as I said, on a second scan, new rows may show up. So all the rows that we read the first time will be locked, but there's nothing to prevent us from inserting another row later. Uh, so we'll go back to our demo here for repeatable read and show you that. First of all, we will restore our database. Again, okay, so we're going to begin a transaction and we're going to select information about all the cities in Illinois that start with the letter A. And we're going to do this in the repeatable read isolation level, as you can see I've specified with repeatable read. So there are 71 zip codes in Illinois associated with cities beginning with the letter A. Um, and if we look at the locks that we're holding on this data, from SysDM Tran locks, you can see we have we have a whole bunch of locks. We have 200 locks being held essentially on all the pages that have these records in them. And they're being held throughout the transaction. Um, so we will roll back now. Now we're gonna play that same little switching game again. We're gonna change the numbers a little bit, so hopefully it runs faster. Uh, but in another session, we're going to, uh, to move records back and forth, just like we did before, except now we're only gonna do it 5,000 times, the first time we did it 50,000 times. And in the second session, in this session over here, we're going to use repeatable read, and we're going to count our results 1,000 times. So now we have repeatable read going on, which means these locks are being held. Um, this will hopefully improve the accuracy of our record count, uh, but it may actually make things take a little longer too, because now we have to worry about locks being held for a longer period of time. I'm gonna take another drink here while we wait for a second.
hopefully it completes around 30 seconds. But I could see it taking as long as it did the first time. So let's see here. There we go. All right, still taking quite a bit. So we're going to stop this session. And let's run our counts this time. There we have it. So the, the, the action of holding the locks in repeatable read now prevented records from moving around. And so we were able to achieve the correct number all 1,000 times. So the data was not changing. Now, phantom rows are still possible, but data movement was not affecting our, our total at all. So what a phantom row, as I said, means is that a new row is inserted, even though previous rows are locked. Uh, we'll show this here by, once again, uh, setting the, the session to repeatable read, beginning a transaction and selecting all the cities with the letter A, which, as I said before, is 71 rows. In another session, though, we're going to insert a new row. Um, and all these locks are being held on these rows we've already read, but there's nothing that's going to prevent us from inserting a new row that qualifies. So I'm going to insert a new town here that begins with the letter A. And it works just fine. And now if I run this query again, first time I had 71 results. If I run it again, though, now we have 72. So that new row I inserted affected the result set within the same transaction. Now that, as I said, is, is a phantom read. Uh, the repeatable reads were, were prevented, or were allowed, rather, by the locks being held, however. All right, so let's commit this. And we can move on to our next isolation level, serializable. Serializable continues the trend of building. It builds on repeatable read. It is the most strict of the pessimistic concurrency models. It does not allow 30, dirty reads or non-repeatable reads or phantom reads. Um, and if a query is repeated within the same transaction, your results are now guaranteed to be the same. This is what we just observe with, with repeatable read allowing no data seen previously will change, which repeatable read addressed, but now no new results can appear either. So if we query something and we have a result set, we run that same query again, we're guaranteed we will not see any new results. And this presents a very interesting problem because we now need to lock data that doesn't exist. We need to prevent the insertion of new data that qualifies within a range. And serializable does this with what are called key range locks. So essentially, these locks will lock a range and they will prevent phantom reads by defining this range that other transactions cannot insert a row within. So if key range locks are present, nothing can be inserted into this row, or, or into this range, I should say. Um, if you select a row or a range that doesn't exist, well, that gets locked too because you selected it and we have to guarantee that nothing new will appear within this range. So if we go back to our little diagram here, range locks will cover the entire range and the first row outside of it. So if we're selecting within this range, uh, as shown by the, the gray box on top here, we have locks over the entire range and we also have the first key outside that range is also locked and that will ensure that nothing can get inserted within this range um, if i had to go for for a picture that described what's going on with serializable isolation it would be a a formal posed photo uh, so we have a photo here of the the united states supreme court and it's nine justices uh, this is a posed photo there's no movement in this photo. There's no photo bombing. We have the notorious RBG in the first row here, making sure that everybody stays in order. No funny business in this photo. It's kind of the idea of serializable. Everything is locked and stationary, and your read will be very consistent. If I took this photo five or six times, I would expect it to look exactly the same. So we'll go on to our next demo here for serializable. I'll close my previous windows because I didn't do that before. We'll re restore our database. And what we'll do here is we're going to once again create a unique index on the zip codes themselves. Um, and then we're going to set the, the connection to use the serializable isolation level. We're going to begin a transaction and we're going to select all of the zip codes that begin with 1051. So where is zip code like 1051 wildcard, right? So there should be at most 10 of these. 
In fact, there are eight. So we have eight zip codes in the US that begin with 1051. If we go look at the locks that are currently being held, because this transaction is open, here's what we'll see. We'll see a whole bunch of shared locks representing data that was read, but we'll also see these key range locks. And you'll notice there were eight rows returned and we have nine key range locks present in this, uh, the current set of locks. So we're locking the entire range, one range lock for each record plus the next one. And then below it, these bottom eight, these are the actual records themselves being locked. So we're locking the records and we're locking the ranges that will prevent new records from being inserted. So you can observe that. Uh, we'll row that back. That's just the, the very brief example of serializable. Um, I could play the game again where we move the records around, but you won't see any, any difference from, uh, from repeatable read. So that's serializable in a nutshell. That is pessimistic concurrency. Now let's talk a little bit about optimistic concurrency. And optimistic concurrency is using row versioning now to prevent concurrency conflicts. Um, the idea here is that with versioning, we need fewer locks, um, and then with fewer locks, you'll have less blocking. Um, optimistic concurrency means that readers no longer block writers, uh, and writers no longer block readers. We have the, the version store that the readers can go to while writers can perform their updates. Um, and so we have higher concurrency automatically just by nature of having less blocking. Uh, very important to point out, though, that writers still block writers. If you have two processes trying to update the same record at the same time, somebody's getting blocked. Um, but this, this reading uh, activity that's now being permitted is a result of the version store. And as I'm sure many know, the version store lives in tempdb. The way row versioning works is that whenever a row is updated, the previous version of the row is moved to the version store and stored there. And each new version of a row has a pointer to the previous version. And these versions are stored for as long as an operation exists that might need them. So if there's a very long running transaction, you could actually build a rather large version store because all these versions would have to stay there just in case that transaction ended up needing them. Um, all, all versions of rows modified by a transaction must be kept for as long as that transaction is open. So if you have a, a system that likes to hold transactions for a very long period of time, optimistic concurrency may not be for you, or you need to make sure you have a lot of space available to tempty because your version store may grow quite large. To kind of give a, a graphic overview of row versioning, if this is a row, this is the current version of a row, we have a, an ID of six, so maybe the key is six and the value is four. We also have a timestamp on each row, so perhaps our time is n. Um, the current version of the row has a pointer to the previous version, where maybe that value was seven at a time of n minus one. Um, and that version might have a, a previous version still. Uh, maybe the value was nine at time n minus five. So we have a chain essentially of all these versions. And when I wanted to um, give an example more graphically, I was watching my son play with blocks. So I decided to come up with a table that is essentially of a data type block. So we have a version store here of my son's toy blocks. Um, and we have different versions of the three rows at different times. So we have a timestamp on each. Um, so to show here the current state of the, of the table, the latest version of each row. Um, it's, a, it's a green sphere and a, a blue rectangle and a red rectangle. Um, and if we were to query the table, we'd see the current state of the table, which, which is what we would expect. But if we had a transaction that was running for a while and maybe needed a previous version of the table, it would use the version store to accomplish this. So maybe at time equals seven, this is what that transaction would see. It wouldn't see the green ball anymore or the blue rectangle. It would see a, a blue and yellow square and a, a red semicircle. That was the state in the version store at that particular time, at time equals seven. If we go back a little further, maybe at time equals four, this would be the result. So we have this version store and we're able to, based on what time something occurs, know the state of the table of these rows at that point. Now, this is all important because the optimistic concurrency models will make great use of this. Uh, the first being a read committed snapshot. Um, read committed snapshot is gives us the exact same guarantees as read committed, but it's an optimistic implementation. So dirty reads are not permitted, but non-repeatable and phantom reads can absolutely happen. Read committed snapshot is statement level snapshot isolation. And this is, this is very important. What this means is that queries will see the most recent committed values as of the beginning of that statement, 
not as of the transaction. So if you open a transaction, say begin tran, and you run two or three select statements, each select statement itself may see a different set of versions depending on what was going on. The, the transaction does not matter in read committed snapshot. So to go back to our block example here, we have a smaller version now. Um, we have versions of each row and the latest version, maybe we start reading this table at time equals seven. Um, so we're seeing, you know, the, the semicircle, the, uh, the square and the multicolored square there. And that's all fine. But while we're reading this data in, maybe an insert occurs. Maybe two of the rows are updated while this data is being read. Now, in a pessimistic concurrency model, blocking would occur. We'd have locks while we're reading the data. New data wouldn't be able to insert. But with optimistic concurrency, this can absolutely happen because there, there's no locks. So the update would occur. Uh, the updating process would not get blocked. It could write its new records in just fine. And the process that's doing the reading, it's not affected either because it's reading from the version store. So the same version will continue to be read and this update can occur without blocking. Now to enable read committed snapshot, uh, you need a little bit different syntax because read committed snapshot is enabled for a database. So this is an alter database statement, alter your database, set read committed snapshot on, and we have some options there of with no wait and rollback immediate. If you enable read committed snapshot, it becomes the default for the database. So read committed snapshot or read committed are the defaults for your database. Anything else you have to explicitly specify. But if you turn on RCSI, that is now the default for the database. This command, running this command to turn on read committed snapshot will block if there are other connections in the database, which is why we have these two options here. So you can specify no wait and no wait will essentially tell your process to, to prevent blocking and just fail. So if there's another connection, it will go ahead and kill itself uh, rather than disrupt the connections that are going on. Uh, there's also a read, a rollback immediate option, which will roll back the other transactions so that yours can succeed in enabling this feature. Uh, generally, when I enable read committed snapshot, I try to do it at a time when there's as few users in the database as possible, perhaps after hours if that's an option, uh, but it, it does need to block the database for a very short period of time while read committed snapshot is turned on. Let's go to our demonstration here of this. So we have a demo script for read committed snapshot and we will restore our database. We're going to enable read committed snapshot isolation on our database now. And um, we're gonna do it with rollback immediate. There we go, very quick. So our reads in read committed snapshot repeatable. What we're going to do is we're going to select the zip codes for the city, any city in the United States named Hoopston. And I can tell you for a fact, there's only one city named Hoopston. It's in Illinois. I'm picking on them because they have an awesome high school team name. Their team is the Corn Jerkers, if you're not familiar. So go Hoopston High. Um, so we know that Hoopston has a zip code of 60942. Now we're going to do is what in this session, we're gonna begin a transaction and we're going to update that zip code to 99999. So we have a transaction, it has not committed, but we have an update on that zip code. In another session, we're going to select the zip code. And of course we see the old version because the new version has not committed yet right this is this is standard but then in this version as soon as we connect commit in the other session it'll update just like we thought um, if this had happened differently blocking would not have occurred so what if we had moved rows around we're going to try the same thing we did before so hang on oh yes there's an open transaction here hang on oops let's roll this back there we go so i can close this how about our previous demo we were doing where we move the rows around? So in another session, we're going to, to move our rows back and forth 5,000 times, just like we did before. And now here with read committed snapshot enabled, we're gonna do our counts again. We're gonna do them a thousand times. And hopefully this is a little quicker this time. There we go, completed in 12 seconds. And if we look at the results, 
we now have the correct results. So not only did the process perform better, right? Remember in read committed and in the other ones, it was taking about 45 seconds. Now it took about 12, one third the time, but it also got the answer correct every time because it's reading from the version store. It doesn't care if the records are moving around because it has a, a version store with a version of the truth to read from while all these, while all these uh, movements are taking place. So read committed snapshot isolation definitely gave us better performance and more accurate results than read committed did for this particular scenario. Let's move to snapshot isolation, our last isolation level. So snapshot gives you the same guarantees as serializable. It doesn't allow dirty reads or non-repeatable or phantom reads, but it is once again an optimistic implementation. So we have this version store in play. Snapshot is transaction level snapshot isolation, whereas read committed snapshot was statement level. Now transactions matter. This is at the transaction level. So any query you run in the snapshot isolation level will see the most recent committed values as of the beginning of that transaction. No longer the statement, but the transaction. And the beginning of a transaction is not when you say begin tran, it's actually the first time data is read within a transaction. We'll see this within the demos in just a second here. So to enable snapshot isolation, it's once again an altered database statement. You have to alter the database and set allow snapshot isolation on. What that does is that actually enables the version store. It allows snapshot isolation. It does not mean snapshot isolation is occurring, but it allows it. Once it's allowed, then you actually still need to go ahead and specify set transaction isolation level snapshot to apply snapshot isolation levels to the entire trans or to the entire uh, connection. So the first statement, as I said, merely allows snapshot isolation. Now, because snapshot isolation takes place at the transaction level, this is a good thing because we have, we have consistency within a transaction that we didn't have with read committed snapshot, but we also can have conflicts. So you can have what are called update conflicts with snapshot isolation that, you, that weren't a problem in read committed snapshot. So here's the scenario here. We have a process that reads data in a transaction and does not commit. So we now have a version store in snapshot isolation with our data in it as this process read it. Meanwhile, another process comes along and reads and updates the same data. So it read it, it has its own version, and then it did some updates. Processes one's, process one's snapshot does not see process two's update because process one has its own snapshot it's looking at that doesn't care or know about process two. So if process one now tries to update, it's going to get blocked. It's going to get blocked because process two already did an update. And remember, writers still block writers. So we have this blocking that's now occurring. And then whenever process two commits, process one is going to error out. Um, it's actually going to die with an error of 3960. So what happened here was we had two processes that were looking at different snapshots, trying to update data. Only one of them could update. Um, process two, in this case, is the one that tried to update first, so it achieves the locks. Then process one will actually error out with a update conflict. And we'll show this here in a brief demo. So we will restore our database one final time. Uh, we will allow snapshot isolation and we will set the connection to use snapshot isolation. Uh, we're going to try the, the read committed snapshot example again like we did the other time first. So we're going to begin a transaction. Uh, we're going to update a table and set Hoopston's record to all nines. Oops, need to change the database. There we go. Now in another session, we're going to also enable snapshot isolation. We're going to begin a transaction and we're going to select. This is going to see the old version, right? The other transaction still hasn't committed yet. But in this sex session, once we commit, if we run it again, we get our update, right? We get 99999. This is, this is what we updated. There's nothing different there. But in another session, if we go back and we run this select again, we're still gonna see the same record as before, before the update, because we began our transaction. We're now looking at those older versions in the version store. It will not recognize the fact that this update occurred and has committed, because we're not seeing it. We're seeing a different version. Now, as soon as we commit a transaction in this second version, now if we come back again and read this, now we'll see, oops, I gotta commit twice, sorry. Um, now we will see that the, it should have seen, 
Okay, I don't know what I did wrong here. But we're running out of time anyway, so we will skip. Oh, did I need to commit it twice here? There we go. I needed to commit it twice over here because I opened it twice on accident. Now we see 99999. So now we see all the records. The, the update propagated. My mistake. I apologize. So going back to the idea of the update conflicts very quickly, we're going to be in a transaction. We're going to select a different city. In this case, I'm picking on a city called Pekin, Illinois. So Pekin has three zip codes. So we've selected them within a transaction. Uh, we're going to go to another state, another session now and do more or less the same thing. We're going to create a or set it to snapshot isolation and begin a transaction. Uh, but here we're going to do an update. So over here in this session, we have the original zip codes, which were there were three of them. In this second session, we're going to run this update and set them all to 99998. There we go. So three rows are affected. All right. Now, in this session, if we were to run our select statement again, we don't see that, that the effects of that update yet. Um, one, one reason why is because we haven't committed it, but the other reason is we're looking at a different version anyway. So now in this session, if we try to perform an update here, let's say we want to update everything to be all sevens, this will block because the other session that tried to update first has a lock on it. So now if we commit in the other session, not only will this session win because it had the locks first, it will it will complete successfully. This second session here, the first session, will actually error out. As I said, it's error 3960, snapshot isolation, transaction aborted to, to update conflict. So we were trying to update, they were trying to update, they won. It will actually go ahead and just kill our entire transaction uh, as a safety measure. And then your application would need to, to retry or address this, however. That is all the demos I have. I just have a few more slides and we'll be done. I'm sorry, we're running a little over. Um, question often comes up about Azure SQL database, right? Not all the clouds are puffy. Sometimes it's a tornado right above your house. Um, everything I discussed here behaves the exact same way in Azure SQL database. So whether you're using SQL Server on-premises or not, um, you will have the same uh, behavior. The one difference is that read committed snapshot isolation is enabled by default in Azure SQL database. So if you create an Azure SQL database, you have read committed snapshot automatically. Uh, if you want to turn that off and use read committed without the snapshot, you can absolutely do that. Uh, but by default, you get RCSI. And then, as I promised, very, very quickly, we'll just discuss in-memory OLTP. Uh, this is an extremely simplified idea of how it works. There are, you know, multi-hour sessions you can attend if you want to read all the details. But to, to show very briefly the differences between everything we just discussed and how in-memory works, um, in-memory uses what's called optimistic multi-version concurrency control. So there are no locks at any time. Uh, there's never any locks taken. There's no waiting because of blocking because there are no locks. Uh, locks don't exist and actually latches and spin locks don't exist either. So you have none of this. You cannot wait on any of those things. You still can wait on some things. For instance, you might have to wait for the, the transaction log to flush to disk, but you will not be waiting because of blocking because there are no locks to create blocking. Um, when you create a memory optimized table, I said no existing data is ever modified. Uh, whenever you update data, and that includes insert, update, or delete, uh, this will create a new version of a row. It may update the metadata, but the row data itself never actually changes. Um, you can have multiple versions of a row in play at once, and then a transaction that needs to read data gets presented with the correct version. The correct version will depend on what time this transaction executed. So a very brief graphic example, let's say we have a memory optimized table with two rows rows here. The, the rows have two columns, so data columns there, uh, the number one and red, so we're, maybe we're storing colors. So row one has red, row three has green. These are our two values. Um, you also notice we have a begin time and an end time. So the begin time is maybe at time 10. The end time is infinity, which essentially means this record is valid between now and infinity. It's the current version of the record. This is a memory optimized table. Now at time 20, let's say, let's let's delete the record one with red and we'll, we'll update green three to be blue uh, and we'll insert a new record six pink. The result here is that we'll have the red row will have an end time assigned to it of 20, which means this was a valid value between 10 and 20, but no other times. Uh, green will also become invalidated. It'll have an end time at time 20. And then the blue and the pink rows will now be inserted at time 20 
with an end time of infinite. So if a transaction come along, comes along and this transaction executed at time 25, it'll only see the rows for blue and pink. Uh, but if it executed at time 15, it would actually see between you know times 10 and 20, so it would see the red and green. So the, the, the rows you are presented with depend on what version was in play at that particular time. So that is an incredibly brief introduction to how in-memory OLTP works. But as you can see, there's no locking or blocking taking place to do these operations. Um, if you'd like to learn more about SQL Server concurrency levels and isolation, uh, what I'd recommend, Craig Friedman at Microsoft has some awesome blog posts on SQL Server isolation levels. Uh, there's also a book by Kaylin Delaney all about concurrency. Uh, she has, I believe, another book on dedicated to in-memory as well. I should add that to the list. Also, Klaus Aschenbrenner in uh, Austria. Klaus has a great blog post about myths and misconceptions about transaction isolation levels. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. I know I went a little bit over on time and I apologize. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or feel free to email me separately. My email address, bob at bobpusateri.com, is up there on the screen. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oops. You there, Julie? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I accidentally muted. So the, ah. the question is, uh, is, is there a default locking mechanism for SQL Server and if it's row or page level? So by default, it will occur at the row level. Um, you can change that with hints, but, but by default and from since SQL Server 2005, I believe it has in fact been row. And then when does it escalate from row to page? Uh, is there a threshold? The threshold, I do not know the exact formula. Um, the threshold for lock escalation essentially depends on memory. Um, all the locks in the lock manager will require memory to maintain. Um, when the amount of free memory starts to approach a level, uh, this is where the lock manager will consider escalating maybe from a row to a, to a table lock, for example, because it will consume less memory to you know, hold one table lock as opposed to, to many row locks. Yeah, exactly. And then um, multiple people are asking about uh, the slide deck and the scripts. My uh, apologies, to... I should have mentioned that. Yes, I will have uh, the slide deck and scripts will be available online for download. Um, I can I can send you the link, Julie. We can put it on the um, on the web page the... for the group if you like. Yep, that's great. Okay. If you want to send anything to me, we'll get it posted. It'll be posted okay. on the DBA virtual chapter uh, archive page for this lecture. Okay. And this is being recorded, so you'll be able to listen to the recording again. And that's that's it for questions. Quite a few people have great compliments uh, and wanted to thank you uh, for the presentation. So thank you, Bob. Appreciate thank the time you. on this. All right. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye.